Um, so I have a pleasure to welcoming you at our already second dissemination activity, having as an objective to present the study results of the social safety chapter and to launch interactive dashboard with the related data. Uh, social safety is uh, the second policy area covered by our benchmarking study 2022-2025. We are doing for any very close cooperation with the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relation of Netherlands. Uh, before I present the study objective, research area, time frame, countries covered by the study, I would like to thank you for funding time to join us today. What exactly will be our agenda uh, for today? We have uh, three major points. I will start with uh, the introduction to our uh, benchmarking study 2022-25, presenting uh, what um, are exactly the objective, what covers, um, what uh, countries we are analyzing, and exactly what will happen in 2024-25 in, in the beginning of 2026. Secondly, we will present the research results of the social safety chapter, and then we will continue with the presentation of our dashboard. And our APA team will show how our interactive tool works, where to find it, uh, what kind of data we can find there, and also how to use it effectively. After those uh, three presentations, I will have the pleasure to talk about next step and present in details what will happen during next three years. Um, as I already mentioned before, we can realize our benchmarking study 2022-25 thanks to the grant from the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relation of the Netherlands. And uh, we are implementing this project in a very close cooperation with the Ministry. And I have a pleasure to present project leader from the Ministry side, Mr. Franz van Donger. Thank you very much to be here with us today, Franz. And I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ivona. It's great uh, to work with you and with the whole EPA team on this international benchmark program on public performance. And I warmly welcome you all to this uh, EPA webinar for the study results regarding the public domain social safety and the launch of the data dashboard for this domain. My name is Frans van Nolle, as Yvonne explained to already earlier, and I'm a program manager of public performance at the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations of the Netherlands. And I'm also the ministry's representative in APAS Board of Governors and a Dutch member in the steering committee for the European Public Sector Awards, APAS Awards Scheme for Public Sector Excellence and Innovation, which will be presented uh, uh, next week again in, in Maastricht. The Dutch Ministry of the Interior has already a long tradition in international benchmarking of public performance going back to the 90s in the last century. And we're happy that we could establish this fruitful, fruitful relationship with APA a couple of years ago to deepen this tradition with an extensive four years benchmark program for 35 countries. We strongly believe that policymakers can learn a lot from international comparisons of public performance in different kinds of functional policy domains. And this is not about winners and score lists, it is about identifying mechanisms, policy systems, interventions, and contexts that are relevant to become more successful and get better public value, better outcomes, more efficiency, more satisfied citizens and entrepreneurs. And a part of international learning from best practices, it is also valuable to learn from examples of underperformance or failures. It's helpful to learn why specific mechanisms 
of, in the, of inter interventions don't work in specific contexts and to prevent that these failures will uh, repeat it, will be repeated. Systematically learning from failures is of great value. And further, it is of greatest importance to bring these kind of study results to the attention of policymakers and stimulate them to use them for the purpose of policy design. And therefore, we welcome very much the initiative of APA to organize webinars like this one and to disseminate the study results. And we also welcome the initiative of APA to give full, flexible and user-friendly online access to the data of the study results. And I'm happy that we will get a demonstration of the online dashboard for the social safety data. And it is interesting to see that even the Euro European Commission has started initiatives that support this way of working with the program Building Capacity for Evidence-Based Policymaking. And lastly, I would like to thank our research partner, Lorenzo Pasculi, for his outstanding achievement with his international benchmark study on social safety and his willingness to present the results here. And I hope you will have an inspiring webinar and give the floor back to Ivona Garwat. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Franz, for your very kind uh, words and this uh, introduction. I propose, uh, if everybody agrees, uh, that we continue with the presentation of uh, involved uh, teams. So I would like to present our APA team and would like to give the floor to Miranda. And then we would, I propose that we continue with Paolo and Bjorn. So Miranda, please. Thank you, Ivana. Um, so I'm Miranda. I work uh, at APA as a researcher, mainly in the area of better regulation, but also have quite a lot to do with data and data analysis. And so that's why I'm here today. I've been working um, on this dashboard um, along with the rest of the team. Thank you. Uh... Good afternoon. My name is Paolo Giovannetti. I'm a research assistant here at APA, and I've worked since the beginning of my time here on the benchmarking study, first on the preparation of the public administration chapter, and then on all aspects related to data and their visualization, including indeed the interactive dashboards we will be presenting today. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Bjorn Helbling. I work at IPA as digitalization officer and also in research. And uh, for this particular project, um, I joined the team uh, specifically for the dashboard itself. Um, so thank you all for the nice uh, for the well made preparation work. And uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy the output that came out of these dashboards. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's also the turn to present myself. My name is uh, Ivona Karvot, what already Franz uh, did. I'm project leader of this benchmarking study and uh, senior lecturer in, in APA since uh, already more than 16 years. And uh, thanks to um, the involvement in the benchmarking study. I have a pleasure to work with France, our APA team, and of course, with the best experts from some very prestigious universities like UCL. Um, and um, we will present uh, Lorenzo a bit later on, um, before we start, of course, the presentation of the social safety study result. Uh, but uh, before we do so, I would like to propose to present you um, objectives and what exactly is uh, the purpose of our benchmarking study. Uh, the main objective um, is uh, to analyze the performance of public administration in 10 different policy areas. We are covering 35 countries, which is a bit different than the previous version of the benchmarking studies. Uh, we agreed with the ministry to cover and analyze uh, the performance of the administration of public services in 27 member states of the European Union plus United Kingdom. 
Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, but also cover Australia and uh, New Zealand, Canada and United States. Uh, we agree with the Ministry as well to uh, make much more in-depth analysis in the 10 policy areas we can, uh, you can see here on the slide. But uh, let me, uh, maybe before I uh, show you and I go a bit more in details about the policy area, um, to tell you a bit of the history of our benchmarking study and also uh, go a bit more in the what we are exactly analyzing. Uh, our benchmarking study is uh, already the fourth edition of the benchmarking study realized for the Ministry of Interior. Uh, the previous ones were published in 2000 for 2012, and the third report was uh, prepared by the Dutch um, um, Research Institute, SCP, and published in 2015. Uh, in 2021, uh, the ministry contacted uh, us and said that they would like to uh, work with us and prepare the, the fourth edition of the study. Um, we agreed that, that uh, we will have a sort of two objectives. First one uh, would be to do the update of the 2015 report and broaden its perspective. So apart from the update, we also evaluate the effectiveness, efficiency, cost effectiveness and satisfaction and trust of citizens, enterprises, and other relevant stakeholders regarding available product services uh, and uh, provision of different uh, products uh, uh, by public administration. And uh, we agreed as well that our analysis will be much more in-depth. And because of that, we also um, agreed with the ministry that we will divide the benchmarking study foreseen um, for 2020-25 period into substance. So we started already in 2022 with the uh, first uh, sub-study covering four policy areas, public administration, education, housing, and social safety. So the second dissemination activity and data is presented today. Um, we already published also on our website the sub-study 2022 three covering three policy area, uh, economy, infrastructure, science and technology and innovation, social security, employment, income and wealth, and also very trendy subject and very important, especially in our era, which is environmental protection and climate change. We already started the preparation of the, let's say, last 2024 sub-study covering three following policy areas, health, sport, culture and participation, and agreed uh, uh, during last year with the ministry, uh, 10 policy area, international social security system. In 2025, uh, we will do the update of all policy areas in all 35 countries and publish the final benchmarking report. We plan to do it uh, after the final conference, which will take place in February 2026. And I hope that you will be able also to join us there. And um, how we are working actually. Um, during the preparation process of the benchmarking study, we are organizing three different types of meetings. Um, we have uh, three working teams and uh, we are 
meeting every two, three months in order to discuss the content, uh, progress made, uh, indicators we are using. And those meetings are taking part between partners, the ministry and other Dutch ministry uh, involved in the process and the APA team. Uh, we also organize separate coordination meetings for each policy area uh, with the Ministry of Interior and other uh, Dutch ministries involved uh, in a relevant policy area, APA team, and of course, authors of the um, chapter. And whenever it's needed, we have internal meetings between our partners and APA team. We are uh, analyzing and doing two different type of uh, um, research, quantitative and qualitative. Um, we are using already existing external data um, from 2027 until today, whenever is possible, of course. Uh, from World Bank, Eurostat, uh, and other possible data sources, and qualitative, uh, so using already existing uh, literature and secondary research. And one of the most uh, important uh, elements of our study is already mentioned dashboard, which is an interactive dynamic uh, data navigation tool, providing insights of the most important data at the glance. And our um, dashboard is uh, publicly available and um, embedded in the APA website. I will show you in a second where exactly we can find our dashboard and also um, already published uh, sub-studies. And um, the dashboard is uh, constantly updated during the entire study, so uh, it will be done during the entire 2024 and 2025. So here we uh, can see where exactly we can find all the information I just mentioned. So when you enter on the APA website, Right on the top, we can see benchmarking study. When you click there, you find uh, they're all relevant information. And uh, that uh, would be everything related to the uh, objective study we are covering in our benchmarking study 2022-25. Uh, and I propose that, that uh, we go into the presentation of social safety performance in uh, 35 countries, what kind of results of the uh, study we uh, had. And I have a pleasure to present our speaker. I would like to thank you very much for all the great work which was done during the preparation of this uh, chapter, for great cooperation and, of course, for funding the time of being with us today and share the study results. So I have a pleasure to present our next speaker, Ms. Dr. Lorenzo Pasquale, who is Associate Professor in Crime Science and the Deputy uh, Director of the DOE Center for Future Crime, Department of Security and Crime Science from University College of London. So thank you very much. And uh, please, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Ivona. Let me share the screen with all of you. Uh, I think you should be able to see it. Can you? Yes, we can. Fabulous. Great. Fabulous. So I will move quite swiftly because this is very rich study, but uh, um, uh, I, I tried to condense it in 10 minutes. First of all, thank you all for involving me in the study. It was a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you for inviting me to today's event and for the spectacular collaboration. It's been really uh, a very, very joyful experience. So thank you. 
and hopefully the results are equally interesting. Now, <clears throat> before I present the results, a bit about the methods. Obviously, Ivona, you already explained very well the overall methods of the benchmarking study. I just want to clarify what I actually meant by social safety in, in the social safety chapter. Basically, any condition that allows citizens to live their life exempt, free from any threat, from any harm, which basically means mostly crime prevention and law enforcement. Uh, what, how we tackled the, the performance of social safety? Well, we compared several data sets, as, as you just mentioned, Ivona, in order to identify the inputs, so how much expenditure and stuff is put into these uh, um, activities, the outputs, so immediate results, arrests, prosecutions, convictions, and so on and so forth, the outcomes, which are broader societal results, such as the, the reduction in crime rates, or the reduction or elimination of criminogenic factors and so on and so forth. Then these data sets were also integrated to try and assess a bit of the efficiency, so the relationship between inputs and outputs, the effectiveness, relationship between outputs and outcomes, and cost effectiveness, so the relationship between inputs and outcomes. Now that said, uh, the list of data set we used for this particular chapter of the study has been considerably broad. Here are just some examples. I will mention some of the sources throughout the analysis. Now, moving on to the results. Inputs. Now, the inputs, um, so the expenditure and staffing, were based particularly on OECD sources and Eurostat. We realized that the average expenditure for uh, um, law enforcement and criminal justice in the EU countries was 1.7% of the GDP until 21, with an increase, uh, which is a decrease from 2020 of 0 0.1 point. But this is just an average. We have considerable differences between different countries. And, I, and as you can see, there is also a difference in where these money actually go, because the vast majority of it goes into police. The second slice goes into courts. The third slice go to prisons and then fire protection and other sources. So there is a bit of a, a different distribution of the money, but also a very different expenditure in different countries. This is a broad overview of the staffing. As you can see, there are countries that have a lot of staff in police forces and the judiciary, particularly Croatia, uh, Cyprus as well, Slovenia. And what we will see later on is interesting that some of the countries that invested the most in police or uh, judiciary are actually some of the countries that perform also the worst in crime prevention or law enforcement. But I'm running ahead. I will tell you more about this later. So after the outputs, the inputs, we need to look at the outputs. So the relationships and the journey from arrests to conviction. A bit of a general trend is that there is a general decline in the number of prosecutions and convictions across the board, so across all the countries, but a less steep, I would say, a less continuing decline in persons arrested, cautioned, or suspected. That means that there is perhaps less efficiency in prosecuting or convicting, or there are increasing numbers of arrests. This is a visualization of what I just said. As you can see, in blue, there is the numbers of people arrested, suspected of caution. In a orange, the persons are prosecuted. And in yellow, the convictions. So you can see that the curve of prosecution is much steeper downwards, whereas the arrests and suspected people are up and down, up and down, but kind of stays more constant in time. This is the average relationship between suspected or arrested people, prosecuted and convicted in different countries, which I will summarize here with an overview on the uh, relationship between prosecution and conviction. The countries that perform the best, so the countries that have more convictions per prosecutions here, are Finland, Norway, Denmark, and the US, followed by others, whereas the countries that have more prosecutions compared to the convictions are Austria, Italy, Belgium, and Croatia. 
As you remember before, I mentioned that Croatia is one of the countries with more judges and police people. So it's surprising that there is this strange relationship. So there must be something to explain this data. Another outputs concern the prisons. Uh, we did a research on the population. So the vast, uh, the, the greatest number of prison population belongs to the United States. Um, other countries have variable numbers, of course, depending also on the population. But remember that these data are based on 100,000 inhabitants per country. So they are not absolute numbers, but are relative to the population. So these differences are not explained by the demographic and saying, oh, well, there's the more people, therefore there's more people in prison. No, these are rates compared to the population. There is a large number of men in prison. The women are the minority, but as you can see in the green line on the bottom right corner, the number of women held in prison has steadily increased from, I would say, 2012 uh, to date. Other outcome, so we move from the outputs to the outcomes now. The main outcome of these activities is the reduction in crime rates. So these graphs shows uh, the general trends of total recorded crimes in all these countries from 2010 to 2020. What are the highlights without going into the detail of the figures? First, theft and burglaries, which are respectively dark blue and light blue, are constantly and rapidly declining, especially theft. This is easily explained by the fact that there are now online environments that allow similar behavior to happen without the risk and physical consequence of you know, stealing something from a house, from a shop, and so on and so forth. So crime is migrating online. On the other hand, there are crimes that are increasing, and these are fraud, homicide, and sex offending, which um, is interesting. Fraud might be related to the online trend because, of course, the fraud is much easier now to commit than before online. More difficult to explain are the rising trends in homicide and sex offending. I wonder whether this depends on the improving of the police and um, prosecution investigations, which make these crimes emerge more than before. So there might not necessarily be an actual increase in crime figures, but it might be an increase in crime detection and investigation. One uh, macro result of all this is that we found that throughout the data sets we compared cybercrime and financial crime, which are some of the most important forms of crime nowadays because they cover a large portion of criminality, are actually not very well recorded by international organizations and in crime statistics. Crime statistics are largely based on very old fashioned traditional forms of criminality like robbery, theft, burglary, kidnapping, some of which, like kidnapping, are absolutely not anymore very popular amongst criminals. Anymore. So one thing that needs to be said, comparisons between different years, different countries can be misleading simply because even in the same data set, for instance, the United Nations data sets on crime trends, countries might adopt different, dif different uh, methods of collection or recording of crimes and crime data, or they might even have legal definitions that affect the way that crimes are recorded. So we need to be very cautious about comparisons. There is a lot of expl explanation about this in the chapter if you're more interested, so feel free to explore it. Another outcome, as we mentioned before, is the reduction of factors that can create crime. For instance, income inequality, uh, we registered the highest level of inequality in the UK and the US, interestingly, while very low levels of inequality in Slovenia, Czech Republic, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Austria. High level of unemployment in Greece, Spain, and Portugal, low ones in Czech Republic, Poland, Germany, Hungary, and the UK. And we have early leavers, so young people that leave school sooner than expected, very high rates in Romania, Spain, and Italy, very low rates in Croatia, Slovenia, Greece, Ireland, and Switzerland. The problem here is that it's very difficult to determine a causal 
relationship between these factors and crime. But nevertheless, I think these data provide an important input when we compare them with all the other data, as we will say at the end of the presentation. Key findings from another outcome, which is the perception of effectiveness of law enforcement. Denmark, Norway, and Finland consistently scored the highest best results in every indicator. Ireland, New Zealand, and Germany are very highly regarded uh, with uh, respect to the due process and human rights. Finland, Switzerland, and Norway, and New Zealand, and Iceland are the most reliable police services and the US is considered to have one of the least impartial criminal justice systems. So very negative point in this respect. What about perception of safety in the areas where these citizens live? So interestingly enough, 82% of the interviewees in the Eurobarometer 2017 feel safe in their own country, 90% in their city, 91% feel safe in their neighborhood, and only 60% feel safe in the EU. You can notice here a trend whereby the closest the, the, the place, neighborhood, city, state, EU, and the higher is the perception of safety. So people feel safer in the neighborhood than in the city, safer in the city than in the country, and safer in the country than in Europe. The Eurobarometer also measures the perception of internet security. Interestingly enough, there is a very low perception of uh, um, cybercrime risk, very low awareness, and very low um, information, I would say, reported by these participants. You have some graphs here. I won't go through this too much detail. What about trust and confidence? The sources here are the European Social Survey and the OECD. Uh, databases, government at glance. The key findings are there is more trust and confidence with the police than judicial system. This is very interesting, particularly in a time in which police is under scrutiny in many states. These findings show that there is more confidence in the police than in the judiciary. So um, here again, there are variations from one country to another. You can see here an idea of a percentage of citizens who have more confidence in the judicial system and the police. The police is in green, so the confidence is generally higher with variations. And now some conclusions about efficiency and uh, the relationship between input and um, output. So Denmark, Finland and Norway constantly have the lowest public expenditure in social safety. So they seem to invest less than other countries. But nevertheless, they also have lowest rates of staffing, but nevertheless, they have the highest conviction prosecution rates, uh, an inadequate prison population, and relatively high prison suicide rates, interestingly. They are though the lowest average prison population rates, and they have a good combination in the disposition time and clearance rate of criminal trials. So they're quite fast in processing criminal trials. Sweden and Germany also have a low expenditure and relatively few staffing and a good conviction prosecution rate. So as far as efficiency is concerned, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Germany seem to be at the top. What about effectiveness? So as we said before, we can't use crime rates to indicate effectiveness because of the difficulty in comparing. However, what we can notice is that Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden seem to have very high rates, for instance, a lot of sexual assaults, but this might not be because there are many crimes, but because there is a very efficient judicial system that detects and prosecutes these crimes. And this is demonstrated by the very high scores in the effectiveness of law enforcement, compliance with the rule of law, citizen perception of safety and trust in the uh, legal, judicial, and even correctional systems. Good scores also in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. The interesting thing here is that uh, what I found is some citizens have a lot of confidence in law enforcement and institutions, but low perception of safety and order, or the opposite. So sometimes the perception of safety don't necessarily match the trust and confidence in the institution. So more research would be required to of course, assess the correlation I mentioned before be between some social factors 
unemployment, uh, poverty, and crime. Cost effectiveness. Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden seem to have the best balance between the investment in their social safety and the outcomes, the result. Other countries have a very low expenditure, but at the same time, a very low perception of effectiveness, safety, and trust, which suggests that perhaps these countries should spend a bit more. Other countries have a low expenditure, but at the same time, they have high perception of effectiveness. And this, for instance, includes the Luxembourg, but the outputs, so the number of arrests, prosecution, and convictions, or prison uh, inmates, are not as satisfactory as the first three countries. So interestingly, and this is something anticipated at the beginning, some of the countries that spend the most in uh, social safety are those with the poorest results. These might indicate either that they have more crime problems than other states or that there is a poor management or resources or the employment. To conclude, Denmark, Finland, and Norway, and Sweden are consistently reporting the best results across all the data sets. Correlations between social factors and crime and social safety are still unclear, even through comparing all these many data sets, more research is needed. And another major point that I want to really highlight here is that unfortunately, despite we live in the 21st century, data about crime is still very poor, is fragmented, inconsistent, incomplete, limited to traditional crime, there is very little on online crimes or fraud or financial crime, and it's very difficult to access for people who are not experts, so it's not really public, publicly accessible. So my main policy recommendation here is to invest more in data collection and analysis. That's all from me. I think I'm quite on time, but I'm happy to leave the floor to someone else. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Franz? Thank you very much, uh, Ivona and uh, Lorenzo. And thank you very much for your um, great presentation with an excellent overview of uh, the study results and the achievements that you have uh, presented. Um, I was just wondering, looking at the results that you just presented, I was wondering in how far uh, could it be possible that um, differences in composition of populations over countries could be also a kind of explanation of differences in performance. Uh, did you do any research about that? When you say composition, uh, do you mean uh, not just the numbers, but the cultural provenance and ethnicity? Uh, Yes, for, for example, cultural differences between populations, uh, 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 sections, or differences in age, or whatever uh, um, demographic uh, differences that could be a, an, ex, expl, uh, an explanation of differences in performance. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question and an important one. So we didn't go into the immigration data and, and similar. Uh, these are notoriously problematic because it's very difficult to draw associations. So uh, I was very cautious in examining those. What I can tell you, though, particularly with respect to age and, uh, um, and particularly sex, is that as we saw, the prison population is mostly dominated by males. This is consistent with previous research that suggests that the male population is more inclined to commit crime. What is not yet possible to examine is whether uh, the lack of data we have on financial crime might actually prove that women are more or equally involved or low, perhaps less involved than men in these new forms of criminality. So that's why I think more data is necessary. And uh, another thing which is consistently demonstrated in previous research is that, of course, young people is more inclined to commit crime because of a series of you know, uh, social psychological factors. And we saw here that some of the countries that have high early, high late rates of early leavers, so people who leave school quite early, are also involved in, uh, uh, you know, higher crime rates or least, um, least efficient judicial systems. So these are the conclusions I could draw from the data sets I have. I didn't dig deeply 
into the correlation between immigration and crime. This could be the item for future research. I hope that responds to the question. Yeah, um, I yes, that, that is a really uh, an, an excellent answer, which which gives some clarification, uh, Lorenzo. Um, I was also wondering when we look, for example, you you were talking about uh, income inequality or other kind of inequality. Um, do you have a, done? Have you done any research on, for example, the impact of? Uh, countries having a, a, a generous social security system or a less generous social security system and an income support or the impact of um, uh, different social uh, economic classes in, in, in society on, on the results of this system in this study? So this is quite, this is quite difficult to do. So um, for one reason, very clearly, I am a lawyer and a criminologist. So I would struggle to be aware of the particular social system of each country. But that's very difficult to do in the context of this study, but it can be what we could do in the future. We could combine the results of the social safety study and the results of the social security study, which is in the 2023 benchmark mm -hmm. study, and see whether there are patterns that emerge. What I did for this particular study, I just uh, looked at literature. So when academics need to explore something which is beyond their familiar zone, what we often do, as you know, is to read papers, to read what other people are saying about that. And it seemed to me that, particularly with unemployment, which could appear one of the easiest and one of the most directly uh, uh, criminogenic factors, Actually, there is a lot of contradictions in previous data analysis and previous data collections by other scholars. So that's why in this study I said, despite there are low rates of employment in certain countries, that is not necessarily an indicator of crime because previous research cannot really demonstrate a straight connection between these two. So I think this type of research would go beyond my expertise and we will need to put up a separate project, maybe with social security, welfare, and employment experts to see what the implication could be. And I suppose it's going to be something very difficult to do in any case, because as I said, the crime rates can be the product of so many different variables that it's not always easy to draw and even possible to draw a straight line, if that makes sense. Thank you very much for these uh, reflections, Lorenzo. Very clear. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Lorenzo, thank you, especially also from our side for this uh, very interesting presentation and uh, uh, great study results. And um, as already mentioned in the beginning, we will do the update. So we exactly during this year, 2024, we will decide what exactly we will cover in 2025 related to update of the social uh, safety chapter. So thank you very much. And thank I would you. like thank to you. propose, thank you, um, to go to the next point of uh, our dissemination activity today, which is the presentation of the interactive dashboard of the social safety related data. So I would like to give the floor to our dashboard APA team, please. Thank you, thank you. Um, so before I start, um, I want to uh, first say that we worked uh, extensively in a team with Paolo and Bjorn. Um, and so we we tried to come up with the best way to interact with the data um, and present the information um, that uh, Lorenzo just um, gave us a summary of. And so I will start by just focusing on a typical journey that you may have if you're interested in um, looking at our dashboard. So I'm gonna share my screen and I will start from the website. Oh, 
as Ivana mentioned in her first uh, uh, presentation, the benchmarking page, landing page, where you can find everything about the study is at, on our website at apa.eu and you can click here on the public sector benchmarking um, link tab. And then you get to a page which tells you everything about the study. You can download the sub-study of 2022, for which this social safety chapter um, was in. But also recently we um, published the 2023 sub-study, which you can also find on this landing page. We have several um, dashboards that will be launched. Um, if you're interested in the public administration chap um, chapter and dashboard, you can go there as well. But obviously today we're focusing on the social safety one, um, which you can click on the explore dashboard, which will be available just at the end of um, this afternoon. Um, and you will be taken to the social safety page where we have everything about the dashboard um, to do with the social safety chapter. So it's just loading and we'll start. So you land on the home page, which has a stylized version of the framework that we used to study the, um, the different uh, elements to do with crime. And there are two journeys that you can take throughout our dashboard. Either you can be walked through the chapter, much like you're walked through it in the case of um, uh, with the different sections in the chapter itself, um, or you can have a very highly interactive journey where you can choose the different indicators and how you visualize them. Um, but Bjorn will talk about that a bit more later. So just focusing for really on the framework here, uh, we have the different elements, inputs, outputs, outcomes, um, in line with the presentation that Lorenzo just gave and the different performance aspects that we discussed, but also this idea of the um, crime in the global era, we wanted to present this in our dashboard it's not in it's in the chapter and it's um sort of explored in a more qualitative way and so i'll just go through how you can interact with this part of the the chapter on the dashboard so i will click on the button that talks about crime and other threats to social safety in the global era and i'm taken to an information page which has a lot to say, so I invite you to check it out. Um, and then you can click on the different elements related to this global era, for example, um, the proximate and remote causes. And then you're taken to a little page which has more information about that. And um, then you can explore based on your interests. Now, I talk, talk, I'm talking now about the crime and threats in the global era but maybe you're interested in the policies and strategies in the global era. And so instead of going back to the homepage, which has the stylized framework, you can also go to the buttons at the bottom of the dashboard and navigate like that through there. So if I do that myself, then you're taken to the page related to the policies. I don't, um, because the information has been presented so well before, I'm obviously not going to go through it now, but um, I invite you to check it out uh, and you will have a good summary of the information. And for more details, of course, you have to visit the chapter that Lorenzo wrote. I'm gonna go back to the home page, which has the stylized uh, framework. And then Paolo will explain a little bit about that, the data, the quantitative um, data. Thank you very much. So after this very brief, but very interesting overview of what you can explore in terms of threats and the policies that can address them, uh, we can delve directly into the core of the uh, conceptual framework underlying the chapter. 
And so, as it was mentioned, in most of it, it's made up of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So let's say that, for example, you're interested in outcome indicators. So if you click here, you will be redirected to this page, a description page for outcomes, where on the left-hand side, you have a definition of outcomes in the concept of social safety. Whereas on the right-hand side, you have a clickable list containing the different subcategories of outcome indicators in social safety. So let's say again that, for example, you're interested in passive effectiveness of law enforcement, regulation, and criminal justice. Well, we can click here, and then we uh, are redirected to a page containing a map showing how well countries are doing in terms of the effectiveness of their criminal justice systems. On this map, uh, countries are colored, of course, only those that are object of the study, they're colored according to their score. And so a darker color corresponds to a higher score. And then, of course, you can also zoom in and look at any particular country you're interested in more in detail. And you can also uh, visualize the scores directly on the map. Then on the next two pages, uh, we, we have presented other indicators, more specific indicators about the effectiveness of criminal systems. And as you can see, uh, you can choose the country you want to visualize. And of course, you can do only one at a time. So if you click, the visuals will be updated. And you have also the indication of the region to which the country, the country belongs. And then uh, in addition to the score for the country you chose, you can also see it for the, you can see the average score for the sample of country under consideration, as well as the average for the region to which your chosen country belongs to. With that, we can move to the section about performance. So again, we have this description page where you have on the left uh, a brief description of the concept of performance. And what do we mean? In general, this is about the relationship or potential relationships between the elements of the conceptual framework. And then on the right hand side, we have a clickable list again of what you can visualize or what you can explore in terms of performance in different domains of social safety. And let's say that we're interested in the effectiveness of law enforcement, quality of government and rule of law. And so we can click and we're redirected to this page. And this is about uh, the most important findings related to effectiveness in uh, various different domains, as you can see here. And so here the focus is on best performing countries that are listed here and on some of the relationships uh, that have been uncovered in the chapter between the effectiveness indicators and other indicators as well, in order to give an idea of the possible associations between good performance and other indicators that affect how well countries do in terms of, for example, law enforcement, criminal justice, as well as correctional systems, order and security, and regulatory enforcement. So the main findings are summarized here. And with that, we can jump back to the home page. And from here, I will give the floor to Bjorn, who will guide you through another type of journey you can take with the data. Okay, thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, as I said, uh, we tried uh, in that first journey to really follow what uh, uh, what also is published inside the report. And uh, for this part, um, for the second journey that you can take, we try to give the user as much as possible freedom to delve into the data itself in, the, in, in a way that really um, allows them to really focus on certain interests or comparisons that um, yeah, to, to search for insights that are uh, of interest to him. Um, this chapter concerns a lot of data and uh, uh, some data is in different time periods and uh, 
So for this uh, for this um, uh, dashboard, we're sorry it looks very dense, um, and we try to simplify it as much as possible already, but to allow for um, uh, for flexibility in using the dashboard uh, and to uh, really look at that view that you wish to look for, uh, we had to keep it relatively dense. Uh, but as you see, we try to guide the, the view. So um, most people will start in the upper part. Um, so it's already saying here, okay, we have the, the input, output, and outcome categories already presented um, in, in the previous chapter. And per category, you can then just select the, the one that you are of, uh, interested in. So for example, the, uh, if I would go, no, okay, I'm interested in the number of police officers in the different countries for uh, the time period. Uh, as you see here, the, uh, the, um, the overall stayed the same, but you see here, okay, here we have data for, uh, for uh, we have more data points. So sometimes there are averages included, which have one data point because it's an average, but here we have a yearly based uh, data. And this is why we also on the left lower side, so everything in that box has to do with time period. It shows you what is possible. And then you can also uh, say, okay, no, I'm only interested in the comparison between uh, 2009 and 2000, uh, 2011 or 2019, uh, which here um, in that particular graph, that's the starting graph, uh, doesn't make that much sense because yeah, we just put now two different time periods. But if we would look, um, we uh, it always allows for four different types of graphs, or it should be allowing. Um, ah, okay, it was sorry, it was just <laughs> taking a second. That is the presentation effect. Um, you see here the, the the time comparison, which here is a, it's a bit much now at the moment. But maybe we just want to look at uh, at countries from northern and uh, northern America, northern Europe. And um, so you can specify uh, or you can dive into the particular indicators. Um, you can slice and dice the data as uh, you're interested in. And uh, an important point is, okay, we have uh, four different types of visualizations. Uh, it always starts uh, with an overview table that gives as much as possible uh, and direct um, visual comparison. If you're more interested in the uh, the values themselves, you can immediately turn, jump to the second table. Uh, the third table uh, allows them for comparison over time. As you see here, we have data points for nearly all of the included countries for the whole uh, time period. It's only for, in that case, it would be, I guess, uh, in Norway, where we only have like data points until 2014. And if you're more the visually inclined, uh, we also have the mapped style of graph that uh, Paul also already utilized in, in one of the other slides, um, where you then also can hover above and uh, always see then directly which values are included. What the software does, it always averages out if overall values selected. So one, uh, this is why it's always like mentioned again and again, this is average values from everything that you select. So if you if you want to have the 2020 comparison, then it makes more sense because then it's from one year, it only has like one value, and then you have the actual number. Um, and because it's relatively dense, it always directly displays uh, how that measurement, uh, how the value is uh, composed. Uh, it always gives you uh, directly the data. So if you're interested in where data is coming from, it displays as well the source. And um, a neat thing is uh, to the right side, it will, because we try to have this, uh, uh, as Fra uh, uh, Franz already said, it's not about competition, but it's also to see from all of the, the input data to look for where Go is set up. Uh, which countries uh, have the highest values, the lowest values, where is there maybe some movement inside the, the trend. If you see here, police officers, uh, at the moment I have only like one year selected, so it is possible to have like a highest value and a lowest value. Uh, but if I select the whole uh, period, 
it also gives you then the names of the countries where the, the trend was the strongest inside that time period. And um, uh, but you can also this was not purely the, the input factor, but if you you would just can go to the outcome category. And uh, for example, here it would be an example of an average. Uh, let's go back to all countries. And the kidnapping rate, uh, as this was both an average indicator, you see here it's the average over the 2010 till 2020 period. Uh, it has uh, one value. Again, we have the highest country and lowest country, but because it's only per country checking one value, there is, uh, we can't display a trend. Uh, but you have uh, the control via the, the different buttons, what you want to include, uh, and the uh, interface itself should do then the, uh, all of the calculations. So for example, in Northern Europe, oh, for that particular one, it's a bit, um, it's, sorry, let me just go to, Corruption rates. This one I know has again more data points. Um, so in that type of graph, the darker it is, the the, the, uh, the higher is the value, which is for sometimes it's but it's not a normative standard because uh, with some indicators it, it would be beneficial to have a higher value. With others, it's beneficial to have a lower value. So you still have to to uh, think what you're looking at, but it gives you like an an interesting way to just. Have the, the first dive into okay, what are the, the interesting sections for you? And um, again, here let's maybe let's do maybe Northern and Western Europe uh, as a comparison, there they're relatively stable. And if we just want to have a comparison for the year 2020. So um, you can look at it in, in different manners. And I guess that is a little bit an overview on how you can slice and dice uh, here uh, what you want. And uh, it's easy to jump back and just select a new one you're interested in. OK, from this. Uh, more self-guided uh, tour. Uh, that's actually the end of this uh, of <laughs> of this uh, part of um, uh, of the presentation. But if there are any questions that are open, please feel free uh, to ask them. Uh, before we finish our meeting today, I would like to very quickly uh, present what was mentioned already in the beginning. Uh, what will happen uh, this year? Um, as uh, already Miranda as well showed uh, in uh, the beginning of the dashboard presentation, um, you know where to find the um, 2022 and 23 uh, sub-studies. As uh, already said, we started the presentation we had in at the end of January, the kickoff meeting for the sub-study 2024. Uh, this sub-study should be done and already uh, at the end of this year and we will publish it uh, as we always do after final conference uh, which is planned in February 2025. We already started to work as well uh, on the updates of the whole benchmarking study uh, which will be done in 2025. Uh, so uh, this year we will decide exactly what uh, we will update um, in what way and we will agree the content with all authors involved in the benchmarking study right from the beginning of 2022. And in February 2026, we will present the whole updated um, uh, Report benchmarking 2022-25. And um, already Miranda as well said that uh, we are doing constantly the uh, um, update of our dashboard. And we also uh, plan 
to organize another dissemination activity. You saw that in the beginning of the presentation of our dashboard, we already um, implemented dissemination activity and you can find the recorded uh, session under public administration. Uh, here on the right hand, we have social safety, we also recorded our session today and you will be able to find your um, recorded session and the dashboard. And we also planned already till the end of the year dissemination activities to present study results and dashboard uh, in uh, April related to education still from 2022 sub study and uh, housing on the 20th of June. Then we will go to the study results and dashboard in September for economy chapter and social security uh, in November 2000, uh, November 27, 2023, of course. And uh, in 2025, probably in March, we will continue with the dashboard of the environmental policy and climate change. So that is uh, where we uh, can find all the information. So uh, from my side, I promise that it will be very brief. I would like to thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, I would like to also wish you a nice afternoon. And I hope to see all of you on the 11th of April, where we will present education chapter study results and the dashboard with the related to the education data. So thank you very much and see you very soon.